Well, good morning. Happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. indeed. I like how uh, John Paul II once wrote it in an encyclical. He said, we are the Easter people and hallelujah is our song. And I think that's a beautiful expression of carrying Easter through as part of the Christian faith. Um, if you're new with us this week or if you're visiting from out of town, my name's Ken Weitzma. Um, you might see my wife or my four daughters running around today too. Uh, and uh, I have the pleasure of getting to be a pastor here. In fact, I was talking to my oldest two daughters this morning and we've kind of for the last year or two been talking about that Malcolm Gladwell principle that if you do 10,000 hours of anything, you become an expert at it. You know what I'm talking about? Um, it's not really that you're talented with the violin, it's just that you put in 10,000 hours. Um, and, uh, and so my, my kids declared to me today that they're experts at church. Uh, they think they've put in 10,000 hours and now they're very, very good at it. So um, just look for four girls that appear to be doing church very, very well. And you have, you have a good, uh, good likelihood of finding my kids. Um, this morning, I'm going to be talking about a passage out of Mark. We can put it on the screen. I'm going to read it and then we'll, we'll pray and open. But this is out of Mark 14 verses 57 and 58. And basically the scene here is that Jesus has already been taken uh, in the, the, the garden on the Mount of Olives and he is, is now kind of been brought before the authorities before he's taken to Pos uh, Pontius Pilate. So this is kind of the, the would-be religious authorities of Jerusalem. And while he was there, it says, some stood up and gave this false testimony against him saying, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days we'll build another, not with human hands. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days we'll build another, not made with human hands. Let's open in prayer. Father, we come to you this morning, and we would hope that somehow we, we could get past the trappings of of a holiday, we could get past the trappings of something familiar and connect with you. Um, we all would love a good day today, but more than that, we hunger for a deeper relationship with you that lasts um, beyond just today. We don't want just good things, we want you. And so I pray that you would open our eyes, open our hearts for what you might have uh, for us this morning and if it's only one word that we'd be able to dwell on that, we'd be able to carry it with us, that some, some way it would be a seed planted and that it would, would grow and bear righteousness in our lives. And we pray that in Christ's name. Amen. So one more time, um, it says that Jesus, when he was in the temple, made the comment, I will destroy this temple, meaning King Herod's temple, meaning the one that had taken 40 years to build, kind of one of the, the highlights of the ancient world in terms of architecture, this beautiful complex, this place where people were supposed to be able to get closer to God. The temple was where the spirit of God dwelt. So as people visited the temple, they're basically coming to commune with God to re, uh, receive forgiveness of sins. So this temple... Um, that, that they revered, that Jesus says that they could tear that down and he would show them that he could build it again in three days, uh, another temple not made with human hands. The interesting thing is Jesus is obviously talking about the resurrection, that in three days when I rise, something else will be created, something else will be made, something else will exist that will take care of the same function or take the place of this building, this temple. Um, when, I, when I explored a theology of creativity, and many of you are probably familiar with me making the comment that, that you are creative, that we're made in the image of a creative God. Uh, in other words, God created us, male and female, he created us in the image of God, we were created. So the idea is that God is a creative being, so if we're made in his image, we too, because we bear his likeness, are creative beings. Um, the artistic ability, artistic talent, is a skill that some possess, but creativity is a human trait that we all possess. So when you say, I don't have a creative bone in my body, you're saying something actually false, and you're saying something that denies the image of God in you. Um, we shouldn't compare ourselves with people that can paint 
or do music or other things that we might not be able to do and say, because of that, somehow I have no creativity. Rather, we should celebrate their artistic ability and go, it really encourages and, and nurtures the creative spark that's in me. Does that make sense? There's 10% of a, a given population that has any specific gift. 10% of you have the gift of mercy. Thank you um, for including me in your fellow group because obviously I have that gift. 10% um, of you might be administrative. 10% of you might be a lot of things. Okay, 10% of you are artistic that have unique talents that way. You, if you're an artist, you are the pastors to the rest of us creatives. A pastor is someone that equips and nurtures other people to do the work of ministry. Those of you who are artistic are the pastors, the creative pastors to the rest of us. You equip and nurture us to live fully into our creativity. Does that make sense? So that's one hallmark of a theology of creativity. The second one, and I think it pertains to this morning, is, is simply this. That when God existed and said, let us make man, let us make mankind, that there wasn't space for that. It, it, it didn't exist. There was, there was no place for that. The very first creative thing that God did was to make space for life. In other words, God wanted life to flourish, life outside himself, so that he could be in relationship with that creation. And the very first thing he had to do was create space for that life to exist. Okay, so he separated light from darkness. He separated water from land. He made space for life to, uh, to exist. If you take a painter, the very first thing they do is stretch a canvas, basically making space for, for, life, um, to, uh, for life to exist or for something to come about and to flourish. So there's something really deeply spiritual about space or spaciousness, room to live and to flourish so that relationships can happen the way that they were meant to be. Uh, a friend of mine by the name of Vainet, he's South African by birth, he's an uh, Afrikaner heritage, uh, was someone, he grew up in South Africa, he lives in Australia now, he's uh, an older guy, a professor, uh, and we talked about this two years ago and he was really informative kind of in my thinking about the idea of spaciousness. But here's how he says it. When I think about God and what he is passionate about, one of the first things that comes to my mind is that he makes space for people to know his life-giving presence. God makes space for life, space in which we can engage him, okay? Uh, and so vain it, again, coming from South Africa, this idea of space is, is really deep for him because he, he comes from a, a country where when he was a, a teenager even, it was a, a country of apartheid, of segregation, um, where land was, was taken from certain groups of people, denied from certain groups of people. They had the whites, the coloreds, and the blacks in South Africa, and you had a place where you belonged and where you could reside, and you couldn't reside elsewhere. And so you had black townships that were pushed into certain areas, and then you had the cities that that thrived where there was space, where you had access to the beaches. None of the townships had accesses to the beaches. Uh, none of the township, uh, townships were able to have land where you could kind of put your family on it and have a thriving existence. And so for Vain, it, this, this deeply spiritual thing of how um, space and justice are connected, that land, space to live, is deeply connected to what has to be created for relationships to be as they ought to be. Um, the Afrikaners, Dutch heritage, outposts that were created in South Africa um, to serve the, the Dutch, uh, uh, Dutch, West, Dutch East Indies Company. I guess it would have been East. So the Dutch East Indies Company, the long voyages around to India for trading on South Africa, creating places for these ships to be. And so you have this kind of early um, arrival of a lot of Dutch people. Now, a lot of the people in Holland that were willing to go be those settlers in South Africa were people that had fled, Huguenots that had fled uh, France during the religious wars. In other words, they were staunch Calvinists 
that made their way to Holland and then were willing to go um, much later and settle here in South Africa. And they brought with them this staunchly Calvinistic worldview that in a perverted way eventually allowed them to have this idea that some were elect and others weren't. Not only in terms of salvation, but in terms of God's ordering of the world and in terms of primacy and priority, okay? And so eventually that theology worked itself out into apartheid. Um, which, by the way, was modeled, modeled almost directly after Jim Crow uh, laws in the South. Our system that we built became the pattern of the blueprint for apartheid in South Africa. So it's funny when we, when we try to stand outside of things and judge. It's, it's really uh, interesting. And so this idea of land and justice and space to live, that then as Vanek goes to Australia, he sees played out again in terms of the Aborigines in Australia and, and the way that they are treated with regard to land. Uh, forced removal from land, um, shutting down cities in the interior of the country because of the cost to give them access to services. And, and this whole idea of somehow we have to have space or room to live. That's, that's the first, one of the first acts of creativity is spaciousness, okay? So the interesting thing is when we come to Jesus and Jesus says, this temple, um, tear it down and in three days, let me build it again. What he's really saying is, I am, am going to create, I'm going to make, I'm gonna open up a, a way for there to be space for you to live in relationship with God, that, that you are somehow reconciled and it's gonna come through my person. In other words, I'm not making it with human hands. I'm not creating buildings so that the space is you in this room, God in the other, and somehow you guys are close to each other. I'm actually going to, with my resurrection from the dead, create a new way that in relationship with me, you find relationship with God. In other words, your identification with me when you become a Christian, when you identify as, as being a part of my body, being a part of the church, that in doing so, you actually are, are entering into space, space that's created for you to have a relationship with God and for you to flourish. He's saying something incredibly deep about his creative justice, his creative energy, and the ultimate desire that his, his creativity is serving, this, this, this intimacy relationship with God. In other words, Jesus' creativity, the highest expression of it, was the reconciliation of all things. The highest expression of our creativity, um, there's a lot of things that can move us, but when our creativity serves the reconciliation of all things, that's where we find the highest, the highest um, and, and best creative work that we're ever gonna find. In other words, what I would call generous creativity or creativity in its overlap with justice. So what does all this have to do with us? or with anything. I wanna explain something to you, and it's, um, it's basically about folk religion. Because I don't think what Jesus says he's going to do is really what most of us think we're asking. Most people, the questions that we're asking really have to do with our, our needs, our felt needs. Our felt needs physically for food or money or opportunity our felt needs for relationship, that this enemy would be smited, uh, that this person I like would be inclined to turn toward me. Um, whatever the case is, our felt needs tend to govern what, what we want or the questions that we're asking. Um, the, interesting, the interesting thing is that in all religions, you have this separation between the professionals and the folk, the, the, the people. And the professionals tend to, to hold the theology, the doctrines, the ultimate metaphysical questions, and the folk kind of come in and ask the felt needs questions. That's kind of the starting point. And in some places, and if you go to different parts of Asia, it, it gets to such an extreme that you'll have what's called folk religion. And folk religion is, is, is really 
um, where we'll see temples, and you see tons of these throughout the world, where you'll see temples where there's actually no professionals. There's no clergy, no priest, nobody of that sort, no teachers. It's just a groundskeeper or, or a caretaker of a temple that, that keeps it up so that, that people can come in and pursue their gods or, or their rituals for rain for the crops, um, that, that this transaction, business transaction, might be blessed in some kind of a way, but it's, it's essentially purely folk religion at this point. In other words, I'm coming in um, and, and hoping that the gods will be pleased and that I'll receive blessing, um, and, if, and if it doesn't, uh, I'll try a different trick next time, um, and if it does, I'll thank whatever local God that is or whatever ritual I tended to do will now begin to be my good luck charm. So every business transaction, I'll go through that same kind of ritualistic observance to make sure that that business transaction is blessed too. So you see a, a, a strong difference when we get all the way to folk religion. I think true religion's a really awkward thing. I think true religion is a really awkward thing. It uses language that other people um, aren't interested in. It's a lot easier to talk about spirituality than resurrection. It's, it's a lot easier to talk about mindfulness or presence than it is about forgiveness of sin and discipleship with Jesus. Um, junior high boys have a thing with, with parents, sometimes specifically moms. Um, I was a youth pastor in my 20s. I watched this over and over again. But there's this really interesting thing, not every junior high boy, um, but junior high boys, when mom comes around, they'll receive whatever mom is going to bring, felt needs, um, but they, they don't want the awkwardness of mom around as it relates to the vibe they have with their friends. In other words, mom embarrasses them or mom might say the wrong thing. Or mom might, you know, try and, try and, you know, fix your collar in front of your friends or get you to stand or sit up straight or remind you of that thing you don't want the other kids to know. You know, you got piano practice today or, you know, and so you kind of get that ah mom thing. Does that make sense? So I think there's a, an analogy here that folk religion is like that cool older person that we do want around when we're with our friends, that takes care of needs and all that, but that makes us feel like we become that much more socially acceptable. Because I'm, I'm friends with the cool older person. I know Jarell. Um, Jarell will drive me around. Um, Jarell's Antioch's youth pastor, by the way. Youth pastors exist to do sunrise services um, for churches <laughs> and uh, other things. I don't know where he's sitting, but he's in here somewhere. Um, so folk religion is, I get my felt needs met, but I get it in the way that I kind of like. It fits the way I've chosen to pattern my life, and it's very comfortable, okay? Um, the mom or the true love, the true relationship, the one that's going to be, your, uh, be there your whole life, the one that would show up at the, at the drop of a, of a dime anytime, any place, um, it just occurred to me, drop of a dime means uh, phones, right? You put a dime in an old style payphone, and mom will come around. So that, that drop of a dime doesn't make sense anymore. <laughs> um, but, but a lot of people here know what I mean. But at the drop of a dime, that's the true relationship that brings felt needs, but brings something much deeper, much more lasting, much more permanent. And when you mature, hopefully, you begin to appreciate this relationship, this one as being the true one, as opposed to just say folk religion. Does that make sense? I, I grew up in, in Christian environments and I, I didn't like um, the true part. I liked the folk part, the part where I got to hang out with my friends at youth groups or go on trips or, or play certain games, or have something to do during the summer. I didn't like the part that talked about dying to self. I, I really didn't like the part about resurrection because I'm very rational. And to me, that, that felt, um, it felt untrue. 
people don't just rise from the dead. So I didn't like that. So I, I would avoid that kind of language. Um, I didn't like uh, tithing, felt manip manipulative. Um, I didn't like basically whatever was showing up uh, on the stage in my teenage years until I got my driver's license was stuff I would, I would take issue with. And then um, as I got my driver's license, slowly, um, I didn't need to go to church anymore. And uh, college certainly didn't, and I became a, a functional, scientific agnostic. Um, I was too smart for all that stuff. And uh, little by little went further and further this way, and I had to come to a place at age 22 where I, I, I said, Either this whole thing matters, things like resurrection, or the traces of it, uh, the folk religion part, is just superstition. And, and so either I have, to, I have to take the whole thing on, um, or, or I'm going to be done with all of it. Either I was made by God, and maybe I belong to God, or I wasn't made by God and we're just gonna keep going the direction that, that at that point in time I had been going and, and uh, see where, where things went. Okay, so that was the question. I began to read books on it. Um, by the way, if you're new with us today, if you go to the book cart, there's three different books. We're gonna give you a free book um, just as a way of saying hi. One of them is this book, The Reason for God. It wasn't out back in those days. It's a really good book similar to the one I read that was really about evidence or rational reasons for believing in the, the validity or the truth of Christianity. Does that make sense? So 1 Corinthians 15 says this. So this is Paul, the apostle, talking about the resurrection. And he simply says this. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, this news, this truth, you are saved if you hold firmly uh, to it. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, Easter Sunday, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, who is Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep or died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and, and not even uh, deserving to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Yet by the, the grace of God, I am. Then he continues, but it is, if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead... How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Let me say that again. If there is no resurrection of the dead, if Jesus did not rise from the dead as a historical fact, then our preaching, my preaching, is useless, and so is any faith you put in the resurrection or in Jesus Christ. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. So then we become peddlers of something not true. We become very awkward people. Um, we become manipulative, trying to twist people to something that, that isn't true. And more than that, we are were, we found to be false witnesses and we have testified about God that he did raise Jesus from the dead. But he did not raise, um, but he did not, uh, raise him in... If, in fact, the dead are not raised, for if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. So this hopeless condition that you find yourself in, in a broken world, Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then you're still in that hopeless condition. Then those also who have fallen asleep, in other words, all of humanity is in a hopeless condition. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most pitied. If Christianity for you is just folk religion, if you just want the benefits and the rituals and to feel like you have something that makes life work, 
Uh, if you just want to have something that's kind of your go-to move, if you want to have a place to go when you need it, but basically being governed by um, a, a need to fix certain relationships or overcome certain obstacles, if Christianity is just going to be a folk religion where we use comfortable language like faith um, and community, not church, and if we're just going to do the comfortable part, but we're not going to actually jump over and say, no, the resurrection happened. Jesus rose from the dead. I believe it as an, an hist, a historical fact. And I'm going to identify with that fact and live my life out in light of that fact as someone who has died to an old self and been raised in some sense with Jesus into a different kind of living that looks just uh, not just to the, the immediate needs, but to a future hope of relationship with God that, that is a way that Jesus has opened up that I'm not just looking to today and felt needs, but I'm looking to a, a reconciliation permanently with God, that I'm not in a hopeless situation as a part of a, a hopeless humanity, but that I'm in a hope-filled situation where I now can be called a friend of God. I can come near to God. I can know God. I can talk to God. I can hear from God, and I can move forward in faith being directed by God, not trying to strive on my own as a way of, of kind of manufacturing a path through life. If, if we only have folk religion, we, we have nothing, says Paul. But if Jesus did rise from the dead and our faith is in that and our identification is with that, then we have everything, says Jesus. So the interesting thing here is Jesus doesn't dismiss the concerns of folk religion. Remember in the Lord's Prayer, he says, give us today our daily bread. Jesus taught us to pray for our basic needs. It'd be wrong for me to try and over-spiritualize and say God doesn't care about um, the situation you're in. God does care about that situation. Jesus told us to pray about that. But Jesus was trying to always say, you're stuck here too much. Yes, this matters. But Jesus was always trying to take us uh, beyond that. So in John chapter 6, a bunch of people had been fed by him and they were chasing him around the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus says, you're coming to me simply because I fed you and, and you want to be fed again. He goes, let me tell you the truth. I am the bread sent from heaven. I am the manna. So Moses in the desert, manna would come. It would feed the people. And Jesus is saying, I'm the manna. I'm the bread sent from heaven to, to earth so that you can be nourished and, and, and live spiritually. In other words, I, if you know me, then you know the Father. If you come to me, I will give you a, a different metaphor, springs of living water. So water quenches thirst, um, bread feeds your belly. I will give you this, this manna that's gonna renew itself every day. I'm gonna give you springs of living water so that you can be nourished at a deeper level as you go through life, not just with kind of your belly or your thirst. And so Jesus was always doing this. Then he gets to the end and he takes the bread of Passover and he breaks it and he says, this is my body broken for you. So take and eat this, drink from the cup, and this is somehow spiritual food for you that reminds you that you have been forgiven, that your sins have been forgiven, that, that they're not going to be held against you, that the angel of death will pass over your home, that you are now a friend of God, that you are identified with me, that you can know um, the one and the, the true living God this spiritual kind of depth of your need, this, this cry of your soul. So Jesus is saying, yes, pray for your daily bread, but, but I'm the manna, I'm this bread. I'm the, the, the bread broken for you. I am going to make in three days time a new path for you to be with God, to exist with God. So it's a fascinating thing. Jesus speaks to our felt needs, but then he also speaks to our real or our spiritual needs. I think this is um, interesting. Pete told me something yesterday. But if we turn to John, um, we, see, we see some really funny things going on in the back of John. Only Pete would, would notice this, of course. But um, notice how quirky John is towards the end of his gospel. I can, I can just, by shorthand, kind of let you know them. At the Lord's Supper, um, John, who's writing the gospel of John, keeps talking about the one whom Jesus loved. And who's he referring to? He's referring to himself. And then the one whom Jesus loved, 
Jesus reclined on his shoulder and, and then the one whom Jesus loved. And then if you get to the foot of the cross, who's at the foot of the cross? The only disciple we see at the foot of the cross. Um, John. So, and then John, who was with Mary at the foot of the cross, Jesus, kind of his last thing was to look out at John and to entrust John with the care of his mother who is about to be disenfranchised all the way. You've got a disillusioned disciple and a disenfranchised mother, but Jesus looks at John and says, John, you take care of my mother. And then fascinating, as you turn to the resurrection, so Easter Sunday, um, so, so Peter, when they hear the news, chapter 20, verse 3, so, so Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both of them were running. But then what do you think happens? Next thing John says. And then Jesus appears to them. No. It's the very next thing John says. But the other disciple, who's John talking about? Himself. Outran Peter. <laughs> and reached the tomb first. You know. And, and then I, who's faster than Peter, <laughs> cared more and, um, you know, it's just really funny. Here's what, when, when, when uh, Pete and I were talking about this, here's kind of the interesting thing for me. When we're immature in our faith, we want folk religion. We want Jarrell, not our mom. We want, we want the comfortable stuff that meets our felt needs, but not the awkward stuff that makes us feel ashamed. Wrong, wrongfully ashamed. That's immaturity. That's the junior high. When we mature in our faith, we mature beyond folk religion and we want um, certainly the benefits um, to our felt needs, that there would be justice, that we would all be able to thrive and to flourish and kind of live the way we were meant to live. But we want the full thing. We want the resurrection. We want this new way to know God. We want to identify with Jesus. We want the awkward part the language that other people aren't going to understand, that they're going to call us weird names about. We want that stuff too. We, we begin to want all of it and more. So Jesus said to Peter when he was washing his feet, Peter was like, this is awkward. It's awkward, Jesus. The other guys are watching. Like, how about we just don't do this? You know, you're the teacher. Let me wash your feet. And Jesus says, unless what? Unless I wash all of you. Uh, unless I wash you, you're going to have no part of me. And Peter says, then wash all of me. Awkward, it's the foot water. Then wash all of me. If that's the truth, then I want the whole thing, Jesus. Wash all of me. Um, if I'm gonna write the story, I'm gonna write myself into the story. Then on Resurrection Sunday, Jesus rose from the dead. And you know what? When I was 22 and I started thinking about this stuff and praying about this stuff, Jesus appeared to me too. And I began to see and to understand and believe how this is a true and historical fact and that I can have a relationship with Christ, that he really can be my savior. I can be forgiven and that somehow in that I come to know God in a really unique and strange way. And guess what? God talks to me. He does. Like I hear God talk to me sometimes. Sometimes I hear wrong and I mess things up. But you know what? God talks to me. And I follow that guidance and I listen to that voice and I chart a new course through life and it doesn't make sense to anyone else, but I don't care because I'm with God and this thing is crazy. We are the Easter people and hallelujah is our song. As, uh, as Wendell Berry says, we got to learn to practice resurrection. That it's not just that Jesus rose from the dead, but Jesus rose from the dead and I actually believe that somehow I am a new creation, that I've risen from, from the dead, so to speak, already. I'm an eternal creature. I look toward heaven. I believe in it and I walk with this Jesus. He's my Lord. He's my master. I'm his disciple. And again, I mess up, but he gives me grace and I'm slowly learning, slowly being sanctified and I, I, I'm actually getting weirder. I'm actually getting more embarrassing to myself, to my kids. You know what? Let me tell you about myself and how I outran Peter. Let me tell you about myself and my intimacy with Jesus and how he leaned on my shoulder. Let me tell you how I'm found at the foot of the cross. Let me tell you all of these things because as Paul said, I am unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ and that he rose from the dead to open up a new way 
a new way for me to live and a new way for me to know God, a new way for me to relate to God and a new hope that I have that not just my belly would be filled but that my soul will someday be in heaven because Jesus says, if I would not have told you, if my father did not have a house, I'd go there to prepare rooms for, me, uh, for you with my father, another relational. In my father's house, there are many rooms. I go there, uh, go there to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would not have told you. Now, that's not a, a, a 10 by 13 room. Jesus is talking to a patriarchal culture, what he's basically saying. And if you go to Palestine today, you'll still see it. You'll see that ultimately you build one big house and you frame it. And then the parents, eventually the kids' families inhabit these two rooms. And the parents go downstairs once the kids have the families. But they're all in one family house. It's still the way in Palestine today. There's many rooms. You're going to get to be with God. That's what you're looking forward to. That's your hope. I built a new temple in three days so that you could know that God is real, that I am true, and that I am the way to the Father. Now, I, I think when I was a, an agnostic and it was really, by the way, I love science, and I don't think there's a tension between science and religion. Don't hear me say that at all. But I needed someone to say, can I bet in your gut you really want a relationship with God, that you, you have an inkling that God is true, that you just need to be willing to look at it and pursue it and say yes to it. And no one, I didn't have anyone that I trusted or, or was willing to be influenced by saying it to me that way. And I believe that there's probably some people here this morning that Easter's okay for you, spirituality's okay for you, Maybe Christianity is okay for you. There's other words that are okay for you. Um, but deep down inside, you hunger for something more. You actually want to be known by God and to know that God loves you and is willing to accept you with all of your faults, with, with all of the mistakes that you've made, with the evil that's present in your heart just like it is in mine, that there's enough grace and enough love in your Father to take and bring you close through the cross of Jesus Christ. Um, and you're maybe scared that if you look deeply into it, you're gonna not believe that people rise from the dead. In other words, I don't really wanna think about the resurrection, Ken, because I'm afraid of what I might come to think or believe. At least I get to hang on to a shred of Christianity, my rituals. I like my rabbit's feet. I like to be able to pretend without having to actually take that awkward step of going, do I believe that Jesus rose from the dead or not? And I wish that someone I was willing to be influenced by would have looked at me and said, you're missing out on all that Jesus promised you could have. The space he is creating for you to live. The new temple that he was making, he said, in three days by which you could know God. You're missing out on all that Jesus was creating and holding on to what Paul says is a, a kind of um, worthless, ritualistic folk religion of Christianity because you're not gonna accept the resurrection or the power of the resurrection. Um, and I invite you today. Not, I'm not telling you, I'm just saying maybe today's the day that you're here and you're like, you know what? I'd rather look into this deeper and find life than to keep going with a folk religion that deep inside I know is not ultimately what I was made for or what I want. Um, maybe that's you. If it is, again, uh, we, we'd love to give a book to you. I'd love to talk to you. Pete Kelly, who's going to do the dismissal here, um, would love to talk to you. Um, but here's the, here's the cool thing. And look at me, because I can see if you're not looking at me. All of you, I believe in the, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I stand here every Sunday because I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I think often about this faith and it makes rational sense to me. And the deeper I go, the more little crazy coincidences line up that affirm my faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the relationship I have with God the Father because and through that resurrection. And, and I'll be honest with you, and you're gonna believe me more with this one. I also know every day 
that I never live up to my best self. And I'm becoming painfully aware of that more and more. And so it's getting easier and easier for me to believe I need a savior. And without one, there's really no hope. Um, that is the gospel. That we who are in need, that God has sent his son to prepare a way. That God is in the business of saving sinners and reconciling back to himself those that he created to be in relationship with in the first place. That is what I hold true. That's the only thing that I really can cling to. Everything else um, I'm beginning to realize is, is, is pretty shabby. All of my own devices. Father, we are an Easter people and hallelujah is our song. Jesus, your son, rose from the dead and we are to practice resu uh, resurrection. We are supposed to live daily in light of that reality. We're supposed to come to know your son and to know you through him. And it's awkward in this world. It's got weird language to it. It's got weird ideas to it. I pray that we would mature beyond the status of a junior higher with regard to our faith that we would mature all the way to being a child who's not embarrassed of their parents, who's not embarrassed or ashamed of any of the awkward things, but loves all of them and wants nothing else. May we start with the faith of a child and return to a faith of a child. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.